Well, record debt, a bleeding job market, two very costly wars, unsustainable health costs, just a few of the massive and rather expensive problems our country currently faces. And here, of course, is Washington's plan to deal with it. Uh, they start by wasting a few months on a false budget debate that doesn't address the problems. Now we spend another day today waiting for votes on the two partisan plans that have no chance of passage. When it's all done, we'll wind up right back at the starting line facing a government shutdown, but not facing the facts. Neither party offering cuts that amount to anything more than a drop in the bucket. You just have to look at the numbers to see it. The House passed GOP bill cut spending by a mere $61 billion. Remember, we have trillion-dollar problems. That amounts to 4.3% of our total debt. And the only more insulting plan when it comes to cutting comes from the Democrats, who offer cuts amounting to, yes, four-tenths of 1%. Meantime, neither tackles the trillion-dollar problems that are sucking money out of our country. The money as it leaves pays off a very small group of special interests, and instead of dealing with this problem, we continue to print more money to cover up the theft. So, who in Washington will face the facts? Who will step up for the future of this country? Even loyal Democrats are asking where our president is. Both proposals will fail. Worse still, everyone in Congress knows that they will fail. The more important question is this, why are we engaging in this political theater? Why are we doing all this when the most powerful person in these negotiations, our president, has failed to lead this debate or offer a serious proposal for spending and cuts that he would be willing to fight for? Joining us now, Texas Republican Ron Paul. Congressman, how much of this budget fiasco lays at the feet of the president? Uh, well, there's plenty of uh, blame to go around. He certainly has a lot of responsibility. But, you know, the problem has started a long time ago. And uh, I see the problem starting 30 years ago. When I first ran for Congress, this was my concern because of the changes in monetary policy. I thought it would usher in an age of big spending and big debt and big government and have warfare and welfare till we can't stand it anymore. And that's where we are. So I think past Congresses and past Federal Reserve uh, officials, uh, the Congress now and the, all the presidents, they never did anything. They always believed that they could live beyond their means. And the people are to blame, too, because, the, you know, most members of Congress over the many, many years always get reelected. I mean, there's uh, resentment growing now and some aren't getting reelected. But most people uh, realize that, uh, you know, if, if they go and vote for a 20 percent cut in Social Security checks, they'd be scared to death. They're going to lose their job. So there still is a strong demand for spending no matter what you hear from the grassroots, and cutting is difficult. And uh, so I don't expect it to happen. I, I think we're going to have a, a much bigger crisis that will bring us down, and then we'll have to decide what kind of a country we want. But unfortunately, there's too much bipartisanship. Bipartisanship in the spending, endorsing welfare and warfare, and bipartisanship now in don't cut anything. Uh, so we're in a mess. You have been able to accumulate power, however, over the past few years as more people in this country come to understand a mess that you've understood quite well for a long time. I mean, you, there was a time when a lot of your rhetoric was considered fairly marginal. Uh, it has now become more and more centralized. Is there anything that you can do uh, to form co issues-based coalitions, for instance, on tax code, issues-based coalitions uh, on the military uh, that could actually affect some change while you have the power that you do have? Well, we've uh, worked pretty hard, uh, a couple of the Republicans and uh, several of the Democrats, especially on the overseas spending. Uh, Barney Frank and Kucinich and I, uh, we've worked together in trying to say, you know, it's time to spend less at, at overseas. It's time to let Germany and Japan pay for their defense. It's time to not get involved in every single war. Now, you know, you, you would think the finances would make them hesitant about going into Libya. But they're not even pausing. I mean, the plans are being laid. So yes, I think uh, I think the coalition should be built, and uh, we and we should work our way out of it. But I, I'm just right now pessimistic that that is going to happen uh, because of the pain that it, it brings upon the special interest groups. Because the many people who come to my office now and say, "Yeah, you better get this budget in, in line," usually leave the office by saying, "Please don't cut mine; cut somebody else's." And that's that's where we are. How much of the the, the cutting issues 
dis not, I would say distract, but are only half the story. We have a huge revenue decline in this country because of unemployment. People don't have jobs. They don't pay taxes. There's not revenue. We have a huge revenue decline in this country because of the dysfunction and, and, and screwed up nature of our housing market. How much is the failure of this Congress, the Congress before this Congress, and then we can continue back into history. Uh, how much are we basically screwing ourselves by refusing to deal with unemployment and housing in a meaningful way? Well, to a large extent. And uh, some people come to the conclusion, well, the revenues went down because they messed up the economy, so therefore we have to raise our taxes on the people who are making money, which would make things even worse. But because uh, people in Washington and the uh, Federal Reserve didn't understand how the bubble-type economy works and the business cycle works. They didn't allow the correction. We've been, uh, the market wants things corrected. They want liquidation of bad investment and bad debt. They need high prices to go down. They need labor costs to go down. And then get rid of the problems, then you go back to work. So we have done everything wrong here in allowing the economy to get back to the position where they can grow. The Fed, uh, you know, believes that you can have... Uh, real wealth and capital come out of a printing press, and it doesn't happen. All that that does is send prices up, and now we're seeing the inflation. We see the inflation in the oil prices and whatnot, but uh, you, you have to get where people understand that working hard, taking care of themselves, saving money, investing, and producing things. That's what you have to have. And then you have more businesses, and that, uh, those are the periods of time when governments actually end up with more revenues than predicted. Predict it. It's just that this recession is different. It's much bigger, it's much worse, and it's going to get worse, and it's going to be worldwide because they don't understand the business cycle and how monetary policy plays such a significant role in the problems that we have today. Uh, and as you know, Congressman, basically since I left CNBC and, and the days of fast money, I, I, this is all I've uh, yammered about as best I can with this. And many people that will listen to me, uh, that seems like the biggest elephant in the room for any coalition to try to deal with because of the, of the influence uh, that the large banking complex has in Washington. But before I let you go, if we look, think about the coalition idea, is if there was one place where you could take your expanding base of popular support and your ability to reach across the aisle, to people like Barney Frank and Dennis Kucinich and others, is it not our spending on these wars in the Middle East, which have the popular support to be ended? Uh, I just I, I, that's the one that strikes me as having the most possibility. Am I wrong in that? Uh, I think you're absolutely right. And I've argued that case that uh, it, it should be the most popular. But the Republicans have been the most resistant to this. But I'm, I think there's being a shift. I notice a shift on the, on the House. And I know the people are, that used to resent me saying this, so, you know, we don't need to be involved in all these wars. They're starting to realize, well, a lot of money, trillions of dollars are being spent overseas. And even I, who don't believe in these social programs, I don't say, well, what we have have to do is cut food stamps and health care for the poor and, and Medicare. I don't think you have to do that initially if you'd set another agenda. Uh, it's the foreign entanglements of all empires that bring empires down. And uh, they're always fought with inflation. That is destruction of the monetary system. So I would say, politically speaking, a different approach to foreign policy. And that's where I think I have achieved the most in working with the opposition and getting some of the conservative Republicans to start thinking in those terms. Yeah, and I would encourage you down that path just from a political standpoint and in insofar as yeah, I think you could probably make the most headway uh, on that issue. We could talk about the banks all day. I'm not sure that anything's going to happen right now. Uh, last question for you. I understand you were uh, made a couple, two, three stops through Iowa recently. Uh, I'm, you know, I don't want to jump to any conclusions, but uh, is it not clear you're running for president? No, no, it's not clear. And I've, I've been traveling and people invite me and I go and I keep trying to spread a message. And they always ask me whether I'm going to run. And I really don't know. And uh, there is that possibility. But uh, I'm not on the verge of making a decision here in the next few weeks. Do you think if you were president, you could uh, uh, help lead us to some of the solutions that you talk about when you do these interviews? 
Well, I would hope I, I, I could, but I'm also very reserved in saying, well, I know all the answers. I think that there are economic answers that I fully understand that could be helpful, but I also know the limitation is the understanding of the people and their willingness to accept what you're saying. If the, you do not have an understanding of what you're trying to do, before, like on the war issue, five, ten years ago, nobody would listen. Now they're starting to because their attitudes are changing. If the people, people really get the type of government they're asking for. If they keep asking for more and more and more, no, I wouldn't, I couldn't do it or nobody else can do it. But if the people come around and say, you know, that makes sense, let's give them support, then an individual or a new Congress could achieve it. Uh, Congressman Paul, it is always a pleasure. Thanks for the time. Thank you. All right. Uh, Ron Paul coming up here on the DR Show.